Hi, everybody. This is Peter Schiff. It is Wednesday, November 9th, 2016, and this is one day following one of the biggest upsets in U.S. political history as Donald Trump shocked everybody by defeating Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was supposedly the most qualified person ever to seek the U.S. presidency, and Donald Trump had no experience whatsoever. And the establishment had pretty much already sworn in Hillary Clinton. It was pretty much a foregone conclusion that she was going to win. I think she was almost a, a 10 to 1 favorite, even on the, 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 the day of the, the, the polls. Once they shut the polls, even the early exit polls were saying that she was going to win. I mean, the polls had had Clinton ahead pretty much the entire time, including the early exit polls. So everybody was convinced that she was going to win. Yet all the while, I had felt in my gut that Donald Trump was going to win this election. And why did I think he had such a strong probability of winning? It's because I understood what almost nobody else in the mainstream got. And that was the phony nature of the U.S. recovery. You see, the entire time President Obama had been congratulating himself for having gotten us out of the mess that was created by his predecessor and bragging about the strength of the recovery and labeling anybody who was criticizing it as peddling fiction, I understood that the fiction that was being peddled was in fact reality and the real fiction peddler was the commander in chief. But not only President Obama, but the Federal Reserve. Janet Yellen and the rest of her cronies at the Fed constantly talked about the U.S. recovery and how the strength in the economy would at some point result in higher interest rates. Of course, Wall Street had a vested interest in peddling that fiction. So everybody believed that the economy was strong and therefore the voters would want to sign up for four more years. After all, if Obama was responsible for the recovery, they would want to continue that recovery under Clinton. They wouldn't want to go back to the supposed failed policies of Bush that somehow were now going to be uh, you know, adopted by, by Trump. But I knew the entire time that the recovery was an illusion and it simply existed in the minds of the people who fabricated it. I knew that the average American was suffering. A lot of these Americans were Democrats who voted twice for President Obama, probably more enthusiastically the first time than the second time. But I knew how much President Obama had let his constituency down. He had promised change and delivered more of the same. He had promised hope, yet now the people who had hoped were hopeless. Uh, he had failed to deliver on those promises, and I knew that the campaign that Donald Trump was running was going to tap into that vein. And in fact, I think the final commercial that Donald Trump ran, his final two-minute commercial, may have been what put him over the top. Because I knew that the only way that people could send a real message that they were mad as hell and they weren't going to take it anymore was by voting for Donald Trump. And in fact, you know, even myself, I had planned up until the last minute to vote for Gary Johnson. That was my intention. In fact, had you polled me prior to the election, I would have indicated my preference for, for Gary Johnson. But I voted for Trump. You know, this is the first time I voted for the winner of an election for the president, I think, in my life. I think I have voted libertarian religiously every year since the first time I voted. I wasn't able to vote for... Uh, for Ronald Reagan the first time he ran. I was a senior in high school, but I was able to vote when he ran for re-election. And I didn't vote for him. I voted Libertarian because uh, I was disappointed in the run-up of the national debt. Even though I liked him, I, you know, I was upset about the increasing debt. And so I voted Libertarian. And I've been voting Libertarian ever since until I just voted for Trump. And the reason I voted for Trump, my, I was driving to the polls and my wife convinced me in the car to vote for Trump. And what caused me to do it was I had been voting for libertarians, not because I thought they were going to win, but because I wanted to send a protest too, because I didn't like either of the candidates. And even though I was living in Connecticut, and I was pretty sure that there was no way Trump was going to win Connecticut, I thought that voting for Trump 
represented a better protest than voting for the Libertarian Party. That this time an outsider had infiltrated the Republican Party and to me represented a better protest vote, a better way for me to deliver a message of disgust to the powers that be was voting for Trump. And more people in the mainstream seem to not want Trump. I mean, nobody really spent much time uh, talking about how bad it would be if Gary Johnson were president. But everybody was assuring us how awful things would be and how horrible it would be if we voted for Donald Trump. It seemed to me that I could piss more people off by voting for Trump than I could by voting for uh, Gary Johnson. And, you know, I knew at that time, if I was making this decision, if I was voting for Donald Trump, out of protest, then a lot of other people were doing the same thing. Now, don't get me wrong, there are things about Donald Trump that I like, but there are plenty of things that I don't. So he's not my ideal candidate, but he was the ideal protest candidate. And I knew all along that this sentiment was there, but it was being underestimated because people believed the numbers. And I have done a good job on my video blogs and more frequently on my podcasts over the years going through why all the numbers uh, were phony why the jobs numbers didn't tell the whole story, why the GDP numbers were inflated. I knew that the rosy picture that everybody was painting wasn't real. And I also knew that the average American knew that it wasn't real. You know, Hillary Clinton's husband, when he ran, said it's the economy stupid. Well, it was the economy stupid again. I mean, despite all the other noise in this election, despite Hillary Clinton's criminal behavior, which unfortunately many people were willing to overlook in their support of Hillary Clinton. And despite all the other issues uh, that dogged uh, the, the, the Trump campaign all along, the bottom line, when people got into the voting booth, they voted their pocketbook and they voted their protest and they voted for Donald Trump. And Wall Street and the mainstream misunderstood this. And now this should be a wake up call. To me, it simply validates everything that I've been saying about the phony nature of this recovery. Now, what is going to happen going forwards? First of all, you know, the markets had already set themselves up for two scenarios. The first scenario was going to be a Hillary victory, which was pretty much baked into the cake, especially after the FBI uh, announced that, okay, we reopened our investigation of the emails, but we found nothing, and now we're closing it again. Uh, the market was prepared for a Hillary Clinton victory. I thought it would be the buy, a buy the rumor, sell the fact. I expected maybe the markets to rally initially, a uh, goal to sell off, and then for the markets to reverse, as they often do. That's actually what happened this time, only the reverse. When the odds of a Trump victory shot up, and it was pretty apparent that Donald Trump won the presidency hours before it became official. I mean, the odds of him winning jumped up to 95%, even though he didn't have enough electoral votes in the bag. You can clearly see that of the dozen or so remaining states, he was winning in every one. And so it seemed like it was almost impossible for Hillary Clinton to actually win, even though none of the networks wanted to say that concretely. If you simply looked at the, the polls and looked at the numbers that had come in, you could make that assessment. And immediately the stock market started to sell off. You know, you had the Dow Jones down 800 points at one point, a huge move down. Gold was up as much as $60. You had huge moves in the currency markets. I think I saw the peso down 13%, but the yen was up about 3.5%, the euro up 2%. The dollar index was down two points. Uh, So everything was reacting exactly the way people said it would react if Trump won. But of course, it didn't last. You know, a lot of it might have been scare tactics. You know, we can't vote for Trump because the stock market will crash. But I was saying all along, why does the market think that Hillary Clinton is so good for the stock market and Trump so bad when Hillary is the one promising higher taxes and more regulations and Trump is promising lower taxes and fewer regulations? That would be better for business and supposedly better for the stock market than Hillary Clinton Although I did understand that the stock market today in America has much more to do with cheap money in the Fed than it has to do with the actual economy or the underlying earnings of the companies. So I thought maybe Wall Street thinks that the cozy relationship between the Federal Reserve and uh, Wall Street and the government had a better chance of continuing under Clinton 
uh, than under Trump, who was a wild card, an outsider, who had been very critical of the Federal Reserve, accused the Federal Reserve, rightly so, of being political and having inflated a bubble. So maybe they thought that a President Trump meant that bubble was going to burst. Well, I don't think so. In fact, unfortunately, I think the Fed is about to get more uh, political than ever. Because if you actually look at what uh, Donald Trump promised while he was running, and if you go and look at his acceptance speech, what is Donald Trump intending to do? He is intending to increase government spending on infrastructure to create jobs, on national defense to make us safer, to take care of our vets, uh, to build a wall. He's talking about massive increases in government spending. And at the same time, he is talking about substantial cuts in taxes. He wants to cut the corporate tax rate. He wants to cut the individual tax rate. This is something that we haven't seen since, I think, Ronald Reagan. In fact, a lot of people are talking about this now as if, hey, this is going to be Reagan all over again. This is going to be huge growth, another Reagan revolution. It's morning in America. Unfortunately, it's more like midnight in America because Donald Trump is going to run into a brick wall that didn't exist at the time of, uh, of uh, Ronald Reagan. And the bond market really is giving a big flashing warning sign. I mean, everyone's going to talk about what happened in the stock market. Oh, the Dow ended up up 250 points. And even though gold was up 60 bucks, it ended up negative a couple of bucks uh, by the time it closed. Although gold stocks had a very good day. In fact, gold stocks outperformed the overall market. But you're not going to hear much about the bond market. And of course, the bond market did have a spectacular reversal because the knee-jerk reaction to the Trump victory or the high probability of a Trump victory was a big rise in bond prices and a drop in yields. But it reversed in a spectacular fashion. This is one of the biggest bloodbaths I've seen in one day in the bond market. You saw a huge spike in yields in the 10-year up to the 30-year. The 10-year is now, I think, almost 2.1 was the high, about 2.9 on the 30-year. These are big moves overnight. And of course, interest rates have been inching up uh, before today, but today was an explosive move. And some people are saying, well, maybe this is just the bond market uh, reacting to the possibility of higher growth. No, this is the bond market reacting to the possibility of much bigger deficits, huge supply. See, what Donald Trump is promising to do is going to explode an already enormous budget deficit. And remember, the Federal Reserve now is claiming that QE is done and that they're raising interest rates. So the only way to finance a big increase in government spending and tax cuts, the only way to make these big deficits possible is if they find private buyers for these bonds. And they don't exist. You know, when Ronald Reagan came into office in you know, 1980, 1981, and he ramped up the deficits in order to pay for his tax cuts, think about the condition that the United States economy was in when he took the reins from Jimmy Carter. First of all, our debt to GDP back then was about 30%. And during the eight years of the Reagan administrations, we increased the debt. Now remember, Reagan campaigned against the debts of Jimmy Carter, and he promised to balance the budget. None of those promises were kept. And he increased the debt, and the debt went to about 50% of GDP by the time he retired. Now, how did we finance this huge increase in government debt? We financed it privately. The Federal Reserve wasn't monetizing it. We had tight money. But also, during the eight years of the Reagan terms, interest rates steadily declined. When Ronald Reagan took office, the yield on the 30-year U.S. Treasury was close to 14%. Now, by the time he left office, it was below 8%. So it wasn't quite a 50% reduction in yields, but it was a huge reduction. At the same time, when Reagan came into office, CPI inflation, you know, the way they measured it back then, which was a much more honest way than the way we do it now, but the official measure of inflation was about 9%, and when he left office, it was 4.5%. So inflation had been cut in half, and we gave bondholders a great deal. Hey, if you want to lend us money to finance these deficits so we can get the economy growing, 
we're going to give you almost 14% and we're going to fight inflation and bring it down. We were giving our creditors a good deal and we were borrowing money when we weren't already broke. And back in 1980, America was still the world's largest creditor nation. So our bonds seemed like a good risk and we were paying a very, very high rate of interest to people willing to loan us the money. Fast forward to 2016, if um, Donald Trump thinks he can pull a Ronald Reagan, if he thinks he can cut taxes, increase government spending, and somehow finance that, it is impossible. And the bond market is just starting to show that. We've already got right now, our debt to GDP is 105%. If we were to increase our debt to GDP by the same percentage as Reagan, it would have to go up to 175% of GDP. That is impossible to do. And remember, what yield are we offering our creditors? We're offering 2% on a 10-year and almost 3% on a 30-year. Who's going to want to buy that, especially when inflation is low but rising? It's not high and falling. We're just coming through the 2% number. And again, of course, that's based on our own you know, inaccurate measures. It's probably already much higher than that, but it's headed much higher. So if we now have an environment of rising interest rates and rising inflation, how is it possible to finance a massive increase in government spending? It's not. And in fact, the bond market is already starting to anticipate this glut of supply. And it looks to me that interest rates are likely to keep rising between now and the time that uh, Donald Trump is inaugurated, which will make all of his plans impossible unless he has the cooperation of the Federal Reserve. You see, he's going to have to break his promise to increase government spending and not cut Social Security, or he's going to have to make the deal with the devil in the Federal Reserve. He's going to have to rely on the Federal Reserve to accommodate this massive increase in government spending that he wants and to finance the tax cuts that he's promised. Because if the Federal Reserve doesn't do this, interest rates will rise to the point where servicing the existing debt is going to be so onerous that there won't be any room in the budget for any more spending. In fact, we're going to have to raise taxes just to pay the increased price tag on the mountain of debt that we have. You see, Donald Trump did a very, very good job of pointing out that the economy was a disaster, right? And in fact, it's actually worse than, than, than he let on. I mean, despite the fact that he painted a pretty bleak picture, he actually sugar, sugar-coated it because the picture was even bleaker, bleaker than the one that Donald Trump was painting. Nonetheless, the average American understood how bad things were. He didn't believe all the hype. But what Donald Trump didn't do is level with the American public to the extent that there's going to be a lot of pain involved in solving these problems. It isn't a pain-free solution, but Donald Trump wanted to get elected. And I think he understood that being the bearer of bad news was not going to get him elected. He needed to have hope of a quick solution. Elect me and I'll make America great again. But he didn't level with the American public to the extent of what's going to be required. Because a lot of people have been been promised a lot of stuff And the government can't keep those promises. The problem is Donald Trump has made similar promises to to the electorate to get elected. And I don't know that he wants to break those promises either. Uh, He's just been elected. So I think the Federal Reserve is going to have to come to the rescue. But it is not going to produce a favorable situation. It is going to produce a massive increase in inflation, a collapse in the value of the dollar, and a currency crisis. You know, Donald Trump mentioned it himself when he was a candidate running for the Republican nomination. He talked about the debt. And he said, normally, when you find yourself overly indebted, he's the king of debt, and you restructure the debt. And the minute he said that, everybody jumped all over him because restructuring the debt means asking our creditors to take a haircut. It means default. That's what we really need to do. We need to default on this debt because it's so massive, we can't possibly repay it. We can't even service it if interest rates go up. But it's not just a bonded debt that we need to default on. We need to default on all sorts of promises that the government made that the taxpayer can't keep. We we need to tell the people on Social Security, you're not going to get all your money. We need to tell people who are collecting government pensions that the money's not there. 
but nobody wants to do that. And Donald Trump did not prepare the electorate for that type of tough love. He was elected based on the fact that he could make America great again without asking anybody to sacrifice in, in the process. But we're going to find out just how much these deficits matter. See, we've been papering over the problem because we've been content to, to live in a financial bubble. We've been content uh, to allow asset bubbles uh, to continue to inflate as the, we allow the standard of living of the average American to deteriorate. Donald Trump wants to do something about that. Donald Trump wants to change the direction of the country. He wants to go back to real economic growth that benefits everybody. But the problem is we have to deal with the elephant in the living room first. We have to deal with the enormity of the debt that we've already accumulated during the bubble years. And there's only two ways to do that. We can honestly default on all these promises and, and, and reboot the economy but ask a lot of people to make to accept a lot of sacrifices because they're not going to get paid the money they've been promised, or we can do it through inflation. And if you remember when Donald Trump initially, uh, you know, floated that trial balloon about renegotiating the debt, he quickly changed and he said, "Oh, we would never have to do that because we could just print money, and that's what we're going to do." And I think that is what he's going to do. So as much as he criticized the Federal Reserve for being co- political. Under, uh, under, under Obama, the Fed is going to be just as political under Bush, I mean, under, under Trump, except a currency crisis is going to intervene and put an end to it. That is where we are headed. And maybe the election of, of, uh, of Trump will accelerate this process of a currency crisis. Because when we try to finance these debts, when the Federal Reserve has to call off the rate hikes, maybe they'll call off the December rate hike, Uh, but they're not going to be able to hike rates when they have to, you know, relaunch quantitative easing because the only way to finance these deficits is for the Federal Reserve to do it because there's nobody who's going to buy these bonds at such low rates of interest and we can't afford to sell the bonds at a market rate of interest. The Fed is the buyer of only resort and when they have to ramp up uh, QE and they and the dollar starts to collapse and the inflation genie that's already out of the bottle and the rate's going to start to pick up, we are going to be headed for a currency crisis and it's going to hit the fan and it's going to happen during uh, the Trump administration. And the, the good thing about Donald Trump being there, being at the helm of this Titanic when we finally hit this iceberg that we should have hit a long time ago is that maybe Donald Trump will have the good sense at that point when we are in a crisis He is not going to avert the crisis. And in fact, with a Republican-controlled Congress, he's going to try to be all things to all people. There is no break at all on on government spending or tax cuts. And as long as they think they can get away with it, they will do it until the market brings an end to the party. And when they do, finally, we may make the appropriate reforms. I think potentially Donald Trump might understand that government is the problem and that the free market is the solution. And a lot of the, the plans that he may have had or that he may have expressed to voters, well, you know, we're going to have to we're going to have to come up with a new plan because we're just too broke to afford that. The debt is too high and we really have to start over. We have to go back to an economy that saves and invests, which means we have to tear up the credit cards, not only on an individual level, but on a government level. We are going to have to check ourselves in a rehab. You know, I've been talking about this for years. We've been high as a kite on government stimulus. The economy is a, a bigger disaster than the one that, that, that Trump uh, campaigned on and was elected on. And so there's going to be a lot more that's going to be required, a lot more sacrifices on a lot part of a lot more people to finally turn the corner and, 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 and reverse the damage. But in the meantime, the, the investment strategy, as far as I'm concerned, hasn't changed at all. We simply maybe accelerated the currency crisis that is in the inevitable result of a sovereign debt crisis that nobody wants to identify. People think that, think that we can run these deficits forever, that there's no limit to the amount of debt that we can run up, that the lenders are never going to want to get their money back, and so we can borrow forever, and rates can stay low forever, and we, we can import forever and run deficits forever. None of this is true, and we're about to come smack dab uh, uh, in, in collision with reality. And hopefully the voters are prepared for it. Hopefully the country is prepared for it. They know that what we were doing before didn't work. So maybe there is a, 
a, a, a, a consensus out there, but I, you know, I doubt it. I don't, I, you know, I don't know that the American public is actually prepared for what needs to be done to finally right this ship. But hopefully we can do it. And maybe we have a better chance of doing it with Donald Trump as the president and Republicans in Congress than we might have been, certainly had Hillary Clinton uh, been president and even worse, had the Democrats taken control of Congress. But that's it for now. But make sure I'm doing far more of my podcasts. I'm doing a couple a week. Uh, So don't wait for the next video blog. Keep listening to these podcasts. And I do expect the market developments. We had a bunch of noise today, a lot of trading and repositioning. The most significant move, though, was in the bond market. And even though gold surrendered its gains, what is happening right now is extremely bullish for gold. We're going to have rising inflation, massive debt monetization. This is the perfect environment for gold. And while the price of gold, you know, generally fell, uh, you know, during uh, the Reagan era, it's going to explode uh, during the Trump era.